This presentation is entitled HRO in Healthcare, uh, where HRO stands for High Reliability Organization. My name is Timothy Mattis. I'm an associate professor at Texas Tech University in the Department of Industrial Manufacturing and Systems Engineering. I'm also the, Indo the associate director of CROP which is Center of Excellence in High Reliability Organizations and Processes, and an adjunct professor at Texas Tech University Health Science Center. I'm presenting this today, or in this presentation today, we are going to discuss really what is HRO. Um, how did HRO come about? Um, why healthcare picked up on HRO and why that may or may not be the correct thing. We're going to get beyond HRO as a buzzword and really get to what the meaning is of an HRO organization. And then we're also going to, or in this presentation, I'm going to pre present my thoughts on how we can actually go about achieving higher reliability in healthcare, um, which goes beyond HRO. So the term high reliability organization came about in the year 1989, and it was defined by Carlene Roberts and her student, I believe, who was Denise Rousseau, who I believe they also worked at Berkeley. And it was to define industries that met certain characteristics that operated reliably from year to year. Now, to go a little bit deeper into this, there is a theory called normal accident theory, which was postulated by a social scientist named Charles Perrault. And according to his theory, by looking at the complexity and coupling within an organization, you should be able to predict the likelihood of that organization having a failure, that those two characteristics should, in and of themselves, predict an organization having an, a failure eventually. However, what Roberts and Rousseau noticed was that some organizations that met these eight characteristics didn't have a failure, right? They were able to reliably, year after year after year, operate without having a failure, even though normal accident theory kind of postulated that they would. And so the high, re high reliability organization was meant to denote those industries, right? Those industries which met these eight characteristics that were able to operate reliably year after year without a failure. Um, it's interesting to note that in that seminal paper in 1989, Carlene Roberts had a quote where she said, hospital emergency rooms are characterized by several of the above character dimension, uh, dimensions. And then she had some other stuff there. But then she says, yet other dimensions are hardly relevant. So in that, even that seminal paper, Carlene Roberts was saying, well, hospital emergency rooms aren't necessarily one of these HRO industries. They meet some of the characteristics of them, but it's not necessarily an HRO industry. And it's been interesting because I think then she started saying it kind of was, but now actually her work, she, the, the last paper that was written, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I have a slide on this, but... Actually, it's kind of now, you know, I think it's been noticing this kind of become a buzzword, right? So we don't want that. Buzzwords are not good. So let's move on. So what are some of these characteristics and elements of an HRO industry? Well, first, let's look at the elements that the, the, the HRO industry is an industry with a stable technical process. That is that it's a repeatable technical process that happens over and over and over again. Workers are assumed to have full knowledge of the system. So not only do they know exactly what they're doing, but that, that workers have a broader understanding of what's going on in the system and how they fit within to that system. And then also the ability to stand down. That HRO organizations, if something goes wrong, they're able to cease operations, get everything back to normal, and then start up operations again. Those are some elements of these industries, not necessarily the characteristics. The eight characteristics of Rousseau, Roberts and Rousseau are coming, but those are some elements of these HRO industries. So the question is, does healthcare meet those, those elements? Are there stable technical processes? I don't know. I don't believe so. I believe that generally there's best practice and there's guidelines, but those have to be adapted for different patients, right? Each patient presents different characteristics and different complications and comorbidities. And so trying to, so it's not necessarily while there are best practices, it's always having to be adapted. Full knowledge of the system? I don't know, right? What knowledge really do people have of how they truly fit in to the overall system? Ability to stand down? I don't think so, right? It would seem like in some industries, such as aviation, you can abort landings. But it's going to be pretty hard when a patient's on the table to 
just stop everything, right? It has to continue. So I don't know. Yes, no, maybe. Um, what about looking at some of those characteristics? Hypercomplexity, um, that is these are organizations in which it's extremely complex, um, the way that parts and people interact. Um, extreme hierarchy, that in these organizations there are extreme power differences and hierarchies within the organization where generally people within the hierarchy have um, process knowledge um, also. So you're your supervisors have an intricate level of the process knowledge that you're doing. Redundancy, that there is an extreme amount of redundancy in the personnel. And that's redundancy in personnel and also redundancy in decision making. High accountability, that if something goes wrong, people are held to very high accountable standards. A tight coupling, what tight coupling mean is that one process ends and another, another one immediately begins. That there's a high level of dependency between between um, between uh, processes that are in series, and there's a high level of dependency, which is also which is also immediate. So things immediately trickle down, or if one, something goes wrong upstream, everything else downstream is almost immediately uh, in trouble. Also, immediate feedback: if something goes wrong, you know right away. Compressed time factors: that decisions have to be made in split seconds, and there's not a lot of time to necessarily beat around decisions, and also simultaneous outcomes. So as something happens, as one thing ends, another thing begins. And you have to figure that this again, what H. Robertson Rousseau defined as an HRO industry, which you saw on the previous slide, one of the things that they observed was a deck of an aircraft carrier. And so you had planes taking off and landing. So a deck of an aircraft carrier is was considered to be one of the models of HRO, also nuclear power plants, right? pieces like that, where those very well fit into these characteristics, but does healthcare, right? I think that's something that we need to ask ourselves. Does it meet the characteristics that were originally defined for an HRO industry? Now, following up on the work of Robertson Rousseau, which was in 1989, there was a book written by Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe who studied HRO organizations and observed that those organizations exhibited what was called a collective mind, right? So they took a closer examination of these industries that Robertson Rousseau had pointed out to really look at what were their managerial practices, right? What were they doing? How were they managing the organization? What were the characteristics of their day-to-day -day practices that was getting them there? Now, again, we, also talk, we, already, we already talked about redundancy and things like that, but those are more characteristics. These are they were focusing, Wyke and Sutcliffe, on the practices of these organizations. And that's where these five hallmarks come from. Now, these five hallmarks, if you know much about HRO, you've probably heard of these several times, where the first three of them look at the anticipation of failure, the last two look at the containment of failure. In particular, they have preoccupation with failure, reluctance to simplify and sensitive operations. We need to think about what those really mean. Now, in this presentation, I don't go into that. Right, but preoccupation with failure, what does that mean? Right? What does it mean to have a reluctance to simplify? What does it mean to be a sensitivity to operations? We can talk about those, what those mean in a healthcare context, but those need to be delineated and also commitment to resilience and deference to expertise. What do those look like in healthcare? So that's something to talk about when once we talk about trying to enact HRO in healthcare. But I would say that part of the reason why it's not exactly clear is because it never was designed in healthcare, right? A preoccupation with failure, that makes a lot of sense when you're talking about the deck of an aircraft carrier and you have people who, you know, if they see a little bolt or screw out of place, they pick it up and they shut down operations and figure out why there was a bolt or screw on the deck, right? It, it makes sense in that context to, to be able to be preoccupied with failure, but does the same thing really make sense in healthcare, right? Think about things like that. Um, in this book, they present these hallmarks, and th these are attractive, right? So the, the good thing about this is they have been able to simplify it into these five points. And so it's easy to enact these across an organization. Also in this book, they present a, a self-attestment tool to be able to assess whether or not your organization, or the, it's a leadership tool, whether or not the leadership feels that their organization is meeting these hallmarks. Again, keep in point that these hallmarks really are meant to develop a collective mind for the organization. That is noticing that to be able for the organization to be safe, the parts of the organization must be reliable, 
right? And so by, by adhering to these hallmarks, the organization will collectively be able to notice when these small deviations in the parts are going on, which may collectively contribute to system failure. So there's a lot of positive points to this because it, again, it, it does address complexity in a sense, and that complexity of, of localized interactions causing system failures. But, and it's something that's easy to enact. And, and one of the things you see in industry, and also in healthcare, is that often you have these failures that creep up, and, and it's a lot of times a result because people haven't been vigilant, right? They let these things slip from their mind, and they get focused on things other than, than this. So HRO is good in the sense that it keeps people focused on, by living to, up to these hallmarks and, and looking at this to collect in mind, it keeps them focused on the right things, right? Kathleen Sutcliffe said, and I was in a, a, a summit that she spoke, and she said that Carleen Roberts was very clear that the term high reliability organization was never meant to be a sticker, right? So Carleen Roberts never intended for an organization to say, I'm HRO and I'm not, right? It was never the intention for that. The intention was always to define a class of industries and to study those class of industries to understand what they did not to be able to develop a sticker for other industries to say, well, I am HRO and you're not. I'm doing these hallmarks better than you are, so I'm HRO and you're not, right? That was never the intent. And again, we talk about buzz things as kind of maybe turned into that a little bit, but that, of course, was never the intent of what HRO was meant to mean. So how did HRO get into healthcare? Well, you know, we've had an evolution. We had 1989, then 2001. And then in 2011, Mark Chasen, who was the president of the Joint Commission, and also I think his name is Jared Loeb, they wrote some papers in which they promote the HRO hallmark as a means to reduce medical error and reduce, to reduce medical error and increase patient safety. They wrote a, a paper uh, in Health Affairs and then a very popular paper in 2013, which is in the Millbank Quarterly, one which is often read. And he also in there has a, a healthcare assessment tool, a leadership assessment tool for healthcare leaders. So kind of borrowed the ideas of, of Wyke and Sutcliffe in their 2001 book coming up with that assessment tool. It's interesting to note, however, that there was no scientific justification uh, in the paper that was written by, by, by Chasen and Loeb it never really says in there, at least I don't see how it says in there, why scientifically what worked in these industries or these five hallmarks in these industries would work in healthcare, right? This, this, this lapse between the disconnect between the elements and characteristics of an HR organization and healthcare, which we saw in the previous slide, those were never addressed by, um, by him within this paper. And so it was more or less just saying, hey, it worked over here. Why don't we do the same thing over here? Again, it's attractive. The five hallmarks are attractive because they're easy managerial tools, but those five hallmarks were specific to HRO organizations. There was no scientific justification of why they would also be applicable for healthcare organizations, which aren't necessarily meeting those characteristics of the HRO. They issued this leadership standard, LDO 30101, um, which doesn't necessarily state HRO in there by the Joint Commission, but I've heard J J JCO evaluators come and and they, you know, it's pretty clear that they talk to leadership and people about what HRO is, right? And they quiz them on their knowledge of HRO, and and so it's something which they're expecting people to know, and their senders uh, kind of address it. And they also have this Oro tool 2.0, which is meant to. Um, uh, help people achieve the HRO within the healthcare organizations. <laughs> Kathleen Sudcliffe, Payne, and Provenost, they wrote in a paper that evidence suggests that healthcare is starting to organize for higher reliability, and then they go on. But then Alice goes on to say, regardless, high reliability remains elusive. So there's a recognition by, by, by the authors of this paper, or Kathleen Sutcliffe is one of the people that that wrote this paper, that healthcare isn't quite making it. This was in 2017, so a very recent paper. Um, that it's still not there, right? That they're, that they're starting to organize, but, but they're not quite making it. Um, and then I guess I did make a note on this. I think I mentioned this obviously. That it's possible that healthcare delivery interest in HRO is a managerial fashion that will fall as quickly as it has risen. And that was by Martelli, Rivard, and Roberts, where that's 
the Carlene Roberts who wrote that seminal paper in 1989. And she was part of this paper that was written in 2018. So there's some gaps, right? You can see obviously there's some gaps here. So why? Why are there the gaps? Well, I believe that we need to take a look a little bit more specifically at the differences between HRO theory and healthcare operations uh, organizations. Um, one thing, healthcare is a humanistic system. Um, there have been lots that have been written about this, and it just makes sense that it's a humanistic system. It's a complex adaptive system. It's, uh, it's got organizational complexity in there. It is not a Newtonian system or a, or a mechanistic system, which HRO industries were. So if you look at if you just look at the how things operate at a nuclear power plant compared to how they operate at a hospital at the or if they, on the deck of an aircraft carrier to a hospital you know at the, the the aircraft carrier you have very people know their roles know their parts very clear communication lines extreme hierarchies it's a very newtonian system where in the hospital you have lots of different people different actors different characteristics um, different um, different responsibilities are all interacting together. It's a complex adaptive system. So in the complex adaptive systems, you have emergent phenomena, and in the Newtonian systems, you have cause and effect phenomena. Uh, phenomena. So it's a different type of phenomena that arises than originally was conceived under HRO. Productivity and process, profitability. Many, many hospitals and healthcare institutions are driven by productivity and profitability. And that's not, that's not to be whatever, that's just the way it is. It needs to make money. And there's something, we, we, often there are programs, Lean Six Sigma, OR Scheduling, many different programs which are continually implemented to try to increase productivity and profitability. However, HRO is not a means to do that. In fact, HRO is very costly. True HRO is extremely costly. You have to have teams, because remember, it, it advocates the rigorous study of near misses. And so you have to have teams who are rigorously studying near misses. And these are people who this is their job is devoted to that. Um, it's, it is something that uh, is not cheap. It requires outside experts. It requires lots of time and focused attention. And the reality is many hospitals just simply, or healthcare institutions, simply don't have the resources to devote to that. It's different when we're talking about nuclear industries and we're talking about government industries like deck of aircraft carriers where that's built into the system. But in a, in a system that has to compete for money or, or has to compete for uh, financial um, resources, or that has limited financial resources, it's, that's a, a very um, limiting factor. Um, there is very little training on HRO in day-to-day -day medical practice, and true HRO requires extensive training, right? Um, I have some examples of when I've talked to people about it. The, 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 one of the comments many administrators gave is, well, why don't you determine how you can teach our nurses about HRO and, and that? And, you know, the, the reality is it's not about it. Yes, nurses, but also healthcare administrators need extensive training, uh, Actually, everybody needs extensive training to the point that most hospitals and most medical institutions are not able to commit the resources required for the training. Variability in core processes, obviously, we hear this all the time, every patient is unique, which it is. Where in HRO industries, however, there are scripted procedures, right? There are no, the, the product is a product. There is very little variation in the product of day to day we're in uh, healthcare, obviously that's not the case. Um, Trade-off in risk and decision-making, patient care is timely, right? You can't, um, when you're caring for patients, you can't necessarily just say, hey, I'm not gonna care for you right now, right? Where HRO industries can stand down. They have the ability to just cease operations, fix what's going wrong and restart. Um, in, in healthcare, often management is by businessmen and women with no clinical background. We're management in HRO industries that's typically done in the hierarchies by people who have years of operational experience. So a person who, your, your people underneath somebody generally, or the person managing somebody generally has extensive knowledge about what that person is doing. They've either done themselves that, that job for years themselves, or they have done their job so long that they know exactly what they're doing. They're not being managed by people who aren't one of them. 
who don't know their specific um, challenges. Um, from my study, it, it, uh, I, I would say that the incidence of consequential medical error on the order of 10 to the minus 1 with sentinel events being on the order of 10 to the minus 4, where the collective mind of an HRO is intended to manage inconsequential incidences on the order of 10 to the negative 1 to prevent errors of 10 to the negative 7 or much less, right? And these 1 in 10 million, not the 1 in, you know, 1,000. So there's a, there's a real disconnect here because often when people talk about HRO, they're like, well, let's reduce medical error. Well, what medical error are we talking about? Because it wasn't intended to reduce medical error that is just medical error that is consequential but not deathly. For example, you know, I, I don't know, medical error using the wrong sutures or something like that. They're, it's not meant to enforce engineered barriers like hand washing and things like that. It's not meant to enforce those things. What it's meant for is to rigorously examine those things to be able to prevent the larger errors where somebody dies of the sentinel events or the the, the, the high impact events. And the orders of magnitude are just much different between these organizations of what they're trying to achieve and what those events are. And also, medical error is viewed through the person where HRO is focused on the system. Uh, medical error generally focuses on individuals where HRO doesn't focus on individuals so much as it focuses on the system. So there's a general um, resolution difference. I was looking through some articles about um, medical error, and this was very interesting. This was a paper that was done in 2008 um, in the Georgetown Law Journal, where these these uh, these medical or these uh, uh, legal teams had doctors review cases, and in particular, they examined 1,452 well, medical malpractice cases. 889 were judged to involve injury due to medical error. Okay. Of those 889, 96% had contributing factors related to the clinician, 56% had related factors related to the system, and 70% had factors related to the system and the patient. So it's not just an error in judgment. Yes, error in judgments do happen, right? That, that there are errors in judgments made. And why are they made? Well, a lot of times because of cognitive errors and cognitive biases, which we'll talk about. But also the system, right? 50% of these had system-related factors. And as you can see here, some of those factors are teamwork and communication, lack of supervision, handoff, other communication problems, inadequate staffing, technology failure, fatigue, right? There were often many other system factors that contributed in addition to the error in judgment that was made. And HRO, it, it doesn't talk about managing, it doesn't look at managing these, these in the sense of breaking down individual factors versus system factors. It really just focuses on the system, right? It doesn't look at the cognitive aspects that the provider provides. It doesn't look at patients being different. It, it, it just looks at the system itself and trying to rigorously examine near misses. So in the healthcare, the failures that are happening have many more diverse causes than just system factors. And we'll get to, we'll talk about that here when we talk about cognition. Okay, so I've pointed out, and I, hopefully it hasn't come across that I'm negative about HRO in healthcare, but I've seen many initiatives that have happened and I've seen many initiatives fail and I've talked to many people in healthcare about HRO, and I really honestly get the feeling that many of them don't understand very well what's going on. They're just focused on how can I make these five characteristics happen in my hospital to be able to reduce medical error, but not really understanding what's going on. So I don't want to be too negative about HRO, but I do think it's important to understand the whole picture. And I think that HRO can be a component of the path to higher reliability in healthcare. Certain aspects of it can be. However, I think there are different things that need to happen to be able to increase the reliability in healthcare, higher reliability. And by higher reliability, I'm really referring to organizational um, safety, that the lack of failures at the organizational level. 
The first of those being to support the cognition of care providers. This goes into that aspect that we were talking about of, of judgment errors. Most of those judgment errors are caused because of cognitive um, issues. Um, develop interventions that promote what was absent rather than what was present in cases of medical error. And also manage localized interactions towards reducing system complexity. So the first of these let's talk about, and that's supporting the cognition of care providers. And to do that, I want to use an example. Um, and the example that I want to use is about children death in hot cars or, or children's dying in hot cars. Um, I didn't know until I studied this that on average, there are a little over 30 heat stroke fat fatalities each year of children that are inadvertently left in parked cars. Now, in before I go any further, too, on this, I had a personal experience with this. When I was growing up, there was a family, I uh, grew up in College Station, there was a family who was a member of our church who left their child in, a, in, in the car. And in College Station in the summertime, it's very hot and muggy, and the car and the child died. Um, these parents were wonderful parents. Um, they were great people. They had about uh, seven children. And it, what happened was, just honestly, there was miscommunication. They, people weren't exactly sure. Everybody thought other, another person had gotten the child out of the car seat. And next thing you know, they come out of the house a few hours later, and no one had gotten the kid out of the car, and, and the child had died. So there's so many factors that went on there. But the, the parents that had this happen weren't necessarily, or weren't, I mean, not necessarily, they were, they were good people, right? There was no evidence that these parents had any neglect or prior abuse to their children. None at all. And that's the case of true in almost all these cases. And in almost all these 30 cases a year, never is there evidence of prior abuse or neglect from the children. So what is it? Right? So there have been people who have studied these cases to figure out, well, what, what went wrong? What do these cases have in common? A couple of things that pop up is that, you know, often there is a change in the parent's routine that day, where instead of going the same route, they follow a well-traveled but alternative route. Um, there's a change in how the parent interacted with the child, right? Often the child would be sleeping, right? Where generally the parent would talk to the child, the child would be asleep, or somehow a change in how they interacted. The lack of a cue. There was no diaper bag in view that day for whatever reason. A change point, right? That during the drive, they they could have gone to work or they went home, or they went home or to work. There was a choice that was made during the day, and that that choice that was made may not have been a choice that was commonly made. So again, a disruption to the routine. There was usually a stressful experience before or after the drive. In particular, maybe there was some fighting going on with the spouse or um, with the child, with another child, or something like that. Something stressful and sleep deprivation um, was often a factor in these cases. So, in these, these child, in these deaths of the hot cars uh, of children, the, what cognition scientists would say is that the habit memory overtook that individual's perspective memory to the cognitive biases that were exacerbated, exacerbated by stress and lack of sleep. So, the person was not able to process the information, to be able to understand the, to be able to think, oh, my child is here, to think about what to do because their habit memory kicked in. Their habit memory is kicking in because of these external stresses and forces that are placed upon them, right? Again, there were these contributing factors as we talked about, lack of sleep, um, you know, changes in routines, things like that. So the question becomes, what should, be, what should happen? Should these parents be blamed for the child's death? And often the answer to that is no, right? These parents, they made a horrible mistake, but should they be blamed for the death? Generally, the answer is no. But should they be held accountable for the child's death? Well, for sure, right? That there was a, a horrible accident that occurred that was preventable. And it was because of this process that happened, right? Their, their, their habit memory took over from their perspective memory because of extern, extenuating circumstances. But they could have avoided it, right? So there needs to be accountability on their part, but not blamed in their part. So maybe the same thing goes for healthcare also, right? That when there are medical accidents that occur, that due to a loss of judgment, obviously 
that there is a judgment error that was made, but probably there's many of these extenuating circumstances that have affected it, both in medicine and other types of errors. Many times when there are these laps in judgments, it's because of something like a child of hot death car, where the, the person's, the, the provider's um, habit memory was taken over from their perspective memory because of external stressors that was coming into their world. And so if this is true, well, how can we avoid this, right? Are there interventions that we could look at to try to avoid these, um, these, these deaths? And that's something from a human factors approach that, that can be taken. Um, maybe we can look at, okay, well, if this is it and it's, this is, you know, maybe we can develop an intervention to where, um, I don't know, the, there's a buzzer on the car seat or something. And every time you take the kid out of the car seat, or every time you take the car seat out, you hear a buzzer. And that buzzer is a trigger or a cue. And if a person doesn't hear the trigger or cue, and they're so used to hearing it, maybe that'll trip their memory to say, hey, wait a minute, there's no buzzer or cue of me getting the kid out. I don't know exactly what it would be, but those are the type of lines that I think we need to start thinking along when we talk about how to reduce medical error due to poor judgment, right? Try to figure out what are those triggers, right? What interventions might we develop around those? In a, the book Blunder, which is a really good book, um, <clears throat> The, the Zachary Shore presents seven common cognitive traps. And there was a paper that actually delineated 19 of those that are common in medical errors. And reality is there's hundreds of biases, right? In fact, there's, there's so many biases that you can't necessarily enumerate them all. However, we need to look at those. What are those, me what are those cognitive biases that enter into the, the care of patients? And what can we, if we can identify those biases and how those are leading to error, then what can we do about them? I think, I like the book Blunder. He points out several, and one of them is confirmation bias, that we often search for what we want to find. Um, the exposure, anxiety, fear of being seen as weak, cause fusion, focusing on one cause, ignoring others, cure allism, if it worked before, it must work again. He provides several medical examples um, from the healthcare world um, surrounding these biases, but that's something that, as an alternative to just HRO, um, really try to get a close examination of these. So again, I think we need to re-envision re the role and use of technology in healthcare. That we should reduce it, we should use technology to reduce the cognitive workload of care providers and to support the decision maker instead of trying to make technology make decisions for us. Um, or instead of re relying on technology to make decisions or to um, yeah, we should use it to support. So we should, we should think about how can we do that. And I think that sometimes the role of technology has taken on an alternative path, that it's become a very big burden for care providers. In fact, you hear that all the time. Care providers say we spend so much time, and nurses, we spend so much time now interacting with forms and technology where before we used to be able to care for the patient. We can't think about the patient because we have to think about all this IT work now that we have to do. IT was supposed to, I believe, the original intent was supposed to help the care provider, but I don't know if it's doing that, right? I think we need to take a look at that, and we need to look at can we use IT to help reduce the cognitive workload of providers, to let them focus their cognition on the care for patients. There was a really good uh, quote from Stephen Kastner of, uh, of NASA, um, where he says human minds create mental models of what something should look like. Computers only process information. And then he goes on, he says, we start with a creative, flexible, problem-solving human and mostly dumb computer that are good at rote, repetitive tasks like monitoring. So we let the dumb computer fly and the novel writing, scientific theorizing, jet-flying human sit in front of the computer like potted plants waiting for blinking lights. Right, and again, you, there's several examples in the aviation industry where that's exactly what's gone on, is technology now tries to take over and people now just monitor technology. In fact, there's recently a, a crash from Boeing where that's exactly what happened, is technology was trying to make decisions and people weren't able to interpret correctly what the technology was doing. So we need to re-envision that, right? We need to be able to use technology appropriately to be able to help us um, make a safe environment. The next one, develop interventions that promote what was absent rather than what was present in cases of medical error. So 
there's a new push out there uh, in the world of, of organizational safety for safety two. And, and they delineate this by referring to safety one and safety two. And this was by a guy named Eric Hologgnol. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that last name right. But he says, okay, well, you know, safety one, most of the time when we look at safety in, in, in complex systems or just in systems in general, we just look at the failures, right? We look at those, those times, those very rare events when things go wrong and we study them to death, which is what HRO advocates actually, right? HRO says, let's find these anomalies and these near misses right here and let's develop, let's, when something went wrong, let's really figure out what went wrong. Let's do root cause analysis, causal factor analysis, five whys, et cetera. Let's really narrow down and figure out what went wrong when something went wrong. But he advocates maybe instead of looking for what went wrong, maybe we should look for what right was missing when things go wrong, right? That maybe we should be saying, you know, most of the time things go right. Most of the time, there are things that we're doing which are making things go right. But when things go wrong, a lot of times those things that we do were absent, right? Yes, there were other contributing factors down here, right? There were other anomalies. But if we look at all the data, right, instead of just looking at a little bit of data, let's look at all the data and let's see, let's not just limit our attention to those, those one or two or very few cases. Let's look at everything and figure out what is going right. What are we doing that are in our organization, which is, which is contributing to leading to um, accidents? And then when things go wrong, maybe those, were, were those things there or not, right? An example of this was in 2018, there was a... Um, Health Authority, I think this was in New Zealand, um, where they had error rates of 7%, right? So that's actually pretty high, right? So that was almost, uh, you know, what, 1 in 13, um, and 1 in 13 um, case, and these were public health records, I think, from New Zealand. I think that was the case. Lots and lots of, I mean, obviously there was room for improvement, right? So when they looked at this from the safety one perspective, that is doing the root cause analysis, drilling down, five whys, doing all that, they found these 10 different um, factors that there were workarounds, shortcuts, violations, guidelines, errors, unreliable measurements, unused user, unfriendly technology, supervisory, right? the common, we would call those the common suspects, right? Those are things which you would kind of expect to be finding when things are going wrong. But what if we were to say, okay, let's look at, instead of just the 7%, let's look at all of the data, right? Which all 100% of the data, or the other 93% of the data. And these seven factors were found to occur, occur disproportionately more often in those cases when things went right. So that would be, again, a diversity of opinion, voice of a dissent, Keeping discussion of risk alive, deference to expertise, ah, that's an HRO one. Ability to say stop, broken down barriers, not waiting for audits, pride of workmanship, that's a good Deming um, principle right there, right? And safety too, these were things which seemed to be good things, good things that when things went wrong were missing. So the approach would be saying, hey, yes, these are bad, we need to address them, but let's focus on this. Let's focus on doing more of this. And if we do more of the safety two things, then maybe the safety one things won't necessarily have an impact, right? They may still happen, but they won't have a detrimental impact because the safety two things will overshadow them. It's a good, it's, it's, it's a really good approach. And it requires data analytics. It requires pattern recognition. It requires a lot of study, um, which, is, which is computationally and also labor intensive. But maybe that's an approach that needs to be looked at in healthcare. So that's exactly the thoughts on this, that we need to look at all the data, not just that data that was generated by an adverse event. Adopt data mining practice. In fact, I, I think that there was something out there saying, I, I can't remember in medicine, but just the total amount or the, just the overwhelming amount of, of unstructured 
data or unstructured text, right? Where those that come in the form of doctor's notes or nurse's notes or um, those notes all have rich information in them, but they're not coded. They're not structured. And so it's hard for people to interpret them. But if we have data mining practices where we can get into that unstructured text and pull out patterns, maybe we can start finding these patterns for what are those things that, are, that we're doing when things go right. Um, and then also creating a culture of learning, right? Along with this is saying, you know, let's learn from our successes and our failures. And let's learn, evaluate, adopt, kind of keep that continual improvement process going on. And finally, manage, manage localized interactions towards reducing system complexity. There is a framework that was developed by Dave Snowden, which is called the Kunavan framework, which I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think that's a Welch word, in which he looks at failures not as being necessarily a failure, but he categorizes those failures according to what type of failure it is or how it, how it, how it relates to the, um, the system in which the failure or the, the mechanisms in which the failure was generated. And he looks at those, and it's more than just categorizing failures, and we'll talk about that, but if you look at failures, you can say, okay, well, it's either going to be a simple, which in, a, in the sense you have, it's a very clear cause and effect. If A happens, B happens, right? If you do this, then this happens, then you, the cause and effect is clear. In a complicated failure, the cause and effect is not necessarily there, there's a cause and effect. Well, in a complicated failure, there is a cause and effect relationship, but it's not necessarily 100% obvious. But it can be, it can be seen, right? So, with expert opinion, with um, with with uh, consultants, with with expert doctors, you can figure out what are these complicated uh, chain of events that led to a failure. Other failures arise due to complex systems and complex interactions. These are failures which are emergent. That is, they can't be necessarily seen looking forward. You can see them looking backward, right? So looking backward, you can say, oh, this is what happened, and this is why it what it was failed. But looking forward, you can't see necessarily how the failure would occur based on the operations of today. They're only deduced in hindsight. And then you have chaotic, right? If you have chaotic failures, they're failures that happen due to a system that's running in a chaotic state. Right? Obviously, we don't want um, chaos, but these three, this simple, complicated, and complex, it's important to be able to understand the differences between those because many times we focus on these simple and sometimes these complicated failures, but don't recognize that many failures that happen are actually due to complexity. So, I, I want to be able to, when I was making this presentation, I wanted to be able to visualize what is complexity, right? How does complexity arise? And one of the things that I found was the work by Stephen Wolfram, which I, I found a long time ago, um, actually, and I never really paid much attention to it. But what he does is he uses stuff called cellular autonomy, which looks at system, which looks at very simple, very simple evolutionary behaviors of a system. And in particular, it's so simple, it's just doing black dots and white dots. So it says, for example, he has different rules, which is delineating a different rule for saying, if in the previous generation there are three black dots together, the next generation will be a white dot. If in the previous generation there's a black, black, and then a white dot, then a white dot. So it's just a very simple rule for how systems evolve over time. And he has lots of different rules, rule 108, rule 110, rule 30. And what do you notice? Well, a simple system, rule 8, for example, after you know, one or two generations, it just dies away. Uh, rule 108, however, after a few generations, it develops patterns, which are easy to be seen, right? So these patterns are these complex, I, I'm visualizing it, I would say these are these complex patterns. You can see them, they, they're, they're here, and you can see them, but you, you need to see it evolve over time. And it starts out, uh, it starts out, you know, with uh, at the beginning you have these different patterns, but then it just quickly converges to a recognizable pattern. In 110, rule 110, you again have this pattern, but notice this is not so easy to look at. 
you can see that I have some order going on here, but then I also have some chaos. So this is an example of a complex system, and it arises from this pattern of behaviors. Again, it has black, 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 white, black, black, black. You can see it's very similar to rule 108. Where's the only deviation? Well, the only deviation is right here, right? That one little deviation in how the next one Right, compare that to that. That deviation there compared to that is the only difference, but it leads to a complex pattern of behavior where before we had a complicated system of behavior. And this is actually pretty cool, right? Because it's, it's, this is just, it keeps repeating over and over where it like goes back and forth between patterns and chaos, patterns and chaos. And then of course you have like rule 30 gives you just a lot of chaos going on here. So, the point of doing this is hopefully to help you visualize this simple um, or this, um, one, this one fact that if we disrupt local patterns of behavior, it may lead to complex, complicated, chaotic, or obvious system behavior, right? Right here, we just had a little disruption of behavior, but it led from a complicated system to a complex system. And when we talk about managing systems that are complex, we talk about managing local interactions. By changing local interactions, we want to try to drive the system to a state like this, or drive it from here to here, right? But we do that by changing little local interactions, not by necessarily looking for cause and effect, because this, again, is complex. It's a, it has emergent failures or emergent things that happen. It can't be seen right now. So if we want to make those things not happen, then we need to look at the local interactions and, and engineer those versus trying to engineer the system as a whole. Um, and so in medical error, the causes of minor medical error, I postulate, are typically due to predictable, albeit complicated, causes, right? M those are minor medical errors, such as, you know, again, something which isn't life-threatening to the patient, yet still um, a, a source of error. However, major, major medical errors generally, I believe, are due to complexity, right? They're in that Kunevan framework of the complex realm. Things which, looking backwards, were like, oh yeah, that happened. But looking forward, it was difficult to see how the patterns of behavior going on today were going to cause this event that happened, right? You can't see it. And so if we're interested in trying to reduce major medical error, instead of hunting for cause and effect, I postulate that what we need to do is experiment with these local interactions. Try to figure out which interactions can we, can we, can we play with such that we make our system go to a more stable state versus those that drive it to a chaotic state. And we do that at the local level, not at the cause and effect level of just trying to engineer barriers for known causes and effects. We, we engineer, we play with local interactions to try to avoid a situation where we have emergent errors. So in managing complex systems, so it's different, managing a complex system is different than managing systems that are not complex, right? So it's a different approach than is generally managing systems and an approach which I believe, I don't have an MBA, but I believe is often taught in business schools. Um, managing a complex system is about learning to influence the dynamics of the system, not controlling the system. Right? We're not trying to control the behavior of the system or force it. What we're trying to do is influence the system to a desired state. And there's a couple of features of that or, or, or principles that go around that uh, sort of management. So the first is the shaping the vision right, for the organization. Remember, people in the complex system, I don't think I mentioned this previously, but they will self-organize. Right? That's one of the complex adaptive features that these agents are individuals who have a certain degree of autonomy who organize themselves. And if there's a goal or a vision, or if there's not a goal, in fact, not a goal or target, if there's a vision for the organization, then it helps people to naturally start organizing around the vision. This should not be a goal or a target, right? A goal or a target is, is horrible, where you have zero harm or zero deaths. Obviously, you don't want zero harms or zero deaths, but that's a goal, right? 
where the vision is more about this is where we want the organization to go. And that needs to be well defined. Um, draw boundaries on localized behaviors, right? So the management needs to set boundaries on people's behaviors, but not try to control their behaviors, right? To say, here's the boundaries. Within these boundaries, you're free to operate, but these are the very clear boundaries of what you can, what you can and cannot exceed. Um, understanding the system dynamics. So as managers trying to really understand what are the dynamics of the system, how are certain people influencing the system, how are certain people or things or policies or places or aesthetics, how are they affecting the system dynamics? Because remember, this system is changing every single day. And so by finding those, those by understanding the dynamics, we can find the, the attractors, and that's the next thing, to strengthen or weaken attractors. We want to understand what are the attractors that are pulling people towards it, and what are the attractors that are pushing people away, pulling to positive results, pushing away towards negative results, right? What are these attractors? And these can be person, places, or things, or, you know, it's not necessarily people, but what are the things in our organization which are pulling people towards the vision or pushing people away? Um, and then also create ongoing safe-to-fail experimentation. Safe-to-fail experimentation, that is a concept that was in this uh, book by um, Berger and Johnson where, you know, it's all about, again, managing these systems is about getting positive attractors to grow and negative attractors to diminish. So we need to figure out what these attractors are and then how we can shape them. Um, and so they, they talk about this concept called safe-to-fail experimentation, which would replace these lengthy, um, and this again can also go towards productivity, not just, not just safety, but it replaces more of the, the longer-term kind of Six Sigma kind of Kaizen event approaches to more just let's run cheap little experiments to try to figure out what are the attractors in the system. So again, short, cheap, finely grained. Some experiments should be at the edges. That is saying, if our problem is like, let's say communication, we don't want to do just things that are at communication. We want to look at what are the, you know, what are, let's, what are the edges of, of the problem and, and do things maybe, if we experiment over here, maybe it's going to help communication, even though it's not directly. Um, diversity of thought, right? That in a complex system, we need diversity. If we don't have diversity, the system becomes too rigid and it breaks. So needing diversity of thought in forming these experiments and keeping diversity alive. Um, running experiments in parallel, some that are contradictory. So it's not just do one experiment, generally do four or five or six of them all at the same time and have some of them be contradictory to the other. So if one would be give people more information per se, another experiment maybe give them less information to try to confirm if that really is a positive attractor or not. Um, and some experiments should fail or learning's not achieved, right? The objective of this is not to run experiments that always work, but the objective is to run experiments where some of them work and some of them fail. And if some work and some fail, then we know that the ones that work must really work and the ones that fail really should fail, right? So not to always necessarily try to get a positive result. So, I think that in, for healthcare, again, it, it needs to move away from these long-term process improvement methodologies and focus on more short-term safe-to-fail experimentation. Um, I think that these, these process improvement methodologies like Six Sigma Kaizen events are good, but they're focused more on static systems, uh, systems that aren't very complex. And they do require, you know, getting teams and, and working and... and uh, trying to find a cause and effect and then implementing best practice and that. Well, that works. Best practice works if you're looking at a very simple or sometimes complicated failure mode. But if you're looking at a very a complex failures that, that are these sentinel failures, these large failures, a lot of times those are more avoidable by doing these short-term experiments versus trying to run a big, long process improvement methodology. And also leadership in healthcare needs to be re-envisioned. Um, instead of looking at leaders as MBAs who, um, you know, do a lot of strategic planning and, and that, I'm looking at ones more who are adaptable to be able to look at complexity and ride the, ride the wave to make a, understand that it's a complex adaptive system that they're trying to manage. So again, in conclusion, healthcare is a humanistic system and efforts to reduce medical errors should recognize this, right? That 
It's not dealing with the traditional system, but one which is dealing with humans who are, again, semi-autonomous agents. Um, adopting practices from other industries might not be the stress strategy for healthcare. Um, there's so much more that goes into medical errors, like cognition failures and... and uh, um, and the cognition failures and, and culture failures that maybe just trying to say, well, this worked in the nuclear industry and this worked on the deck of the aircraft carrier, so it should work in healthcare. Maybe that's not the best approach, right? Maybe it's a little better to study um, the unique aspects of healthcare and, and try to develop interventions around those. Technology should support the cognition of care providers, not attempt to replace or inflict cognitive workload that really we should take a look at at technology and whether or not that's actually leading to more medical error and when in the original intention was probably for it not to. Um, learning about medical errors to come more from just incidents of medical error, that gives back to the safety one and safety two, right? Instead of just drilling down on those bad events, actually considering the good things too. Try to look at all the data. And that managing complexity is the key to reducing sentinel events. Um, not so much cause and effect, but trying to look at those emergent, uh, the, the emergent aspect of the complex system, which is often more the underlying cause of those, those uh, sentinel events, which are quite often unforeseen prior to their, their occurrence. Thank you for your time and attention to this video.